plovers. If you live in Europe or North America, you may think of a small to medium sized wading bird resembling a crane which is relatively friendly and keeps to itself. In fact, in countries such as Iceland, they are seen as a blessing, signifying the start of warmer seasons. In Australia, however, plovers have a different meaning. You may notice them when you travel to work or school, when you go for a walk in the park, or even when you step out into your own front yard. They look like the results of a one night stand between a chicken and a crane gone wrong. These are plovers. Though if you live in Australia, you're well and truly aware of that. Many an Australian school kid was told to avoid these birds at all costs, otherwise they'll be stung by the poisonous spurs as they mercilessly swoop upon you. But how much of this is actually true? In this video, we'll find out. The first misconception about plovers is in the name. Whilst people refer to them as either plovers or spurwing plovers, they are not actually plovers. Yes, they have been using an alias this whole time. Their real name is the Masked Lapwing. Yes, they are lapwings. You probably don't know what lapwings are or what differentiates them from plovers. And to be perfectly honest, I don't either. Or didn't, until I made this video. Now, I couldn't really find much on why they decided to classify masked lapwings as lapwings specifically, rather than just plovers like everyone else. So instead, I decided to analyse the features of both regular plovers and masked lapwings, and discover the differences ourselves. Damn monetization of the science sector. From the limited research that I was able to conduct, I found that lapwings and plovers are not actually that much different. In fact, they are both part of the Charadridae family. But unlike regular plovers, lapwings are part of the Vanillinae subfamily. I probably screwed that pronunciation up. So what is the major distinction, you ask, as I try to skirt around the question like a corrupt politician? Well, it's complicated. Okay, 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 it's in the wings. Lapwings tend to have more rounded wingtips than their plover counterparts. On top of this, lapwings are slightly bigger in size with a distinctive crest on the top of their head. Distinctive crest on the top of their head. But it's mainly the wings. But before we dissect their notorious reputation and compare it with their observed behaviour, we must first elaborate on the basics, such as physical features, and their native habitat. Mask lapwings, also known as spurwing plovers or vanilla smiles if you're a snob, can be easily identified if you live in Australia, perhaps even if you don't. They have an average height of between 30 to 37 centimetres. Terrifying, right? With a wingspan of 75 to 85 centimetres. Their weight can vary between 191 and 412 grams. The wings and back are a shade of brown with the outer part of the wing's feathers a distinct black. Their most iconic body part is the spurs of the wings, near the middle. Underneath, they have a white chest with tall, thin red legs. Their head has black feathers atop of it, and a face with yellow wattles, similar to those of a rooster. Finally, they have a long, needly yellow beak. An interesting note about masked lapwings is that they have a nicotating membrane. This is used to protect and moisten the eyes, while still maintaining vision. They're basically the bird equivalent of Joseph Stalin. As I previously mentioned, masked lapwings are native to Australia. Specifically, they dwell in the eastern half of the country in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and the Northern Territory. Very rarely are they spotted in Western Australia if at all. Mask lapwings also reside in other countries such as Indonesia, New Zealand and France. Well, by France I mean New Caledonia, which is an overseas territory of France. These are primarily groups that have migrated from Australia. 
Masked lapwings have a preference for the flatlands. These include swamps, marshes, mudflats, beaches and grasslands. However, according to the Northern Territory government, they can be picky enough to avoid areas of extensive foliage and long grasses. Perhaps this is why they tend to inhabit areas populated by humans, such as urban and rural environments, where they can terrify the local inhabitants. And now, time for the part that you've all been waiting for, the behavioural patterns. Are plovers, I mean masked lapwings, as aggressive as people say they are? Or are they just motivated by love? Plovers are little shits, or I would say that if I only had negative experiences with them and didn't properly do my research. The life of a plover begins in the egg. For most bird species, the egg begins its journey as a cell. The proper development of the egg starts once the female's hormones change. Beats me how that happens. First, the size of the cell increases. Next, the yolk is created and becomes bigger. Once that happens, the egg passes through the mouth of the oviduct, where it will be fertilised, assuming a male was able to successfully deposit his sperm, if you know what I mean. Whether or not it is fertilised, it will still continue through the oviduct to gradually grow. Next, the egg membranes and the albumen are added. Then, the mass of yolk, membrane, albumen and embryo are hydrated and shaped into the oval shape that we all know. Finally, the shell is formed and the embryo can properly initiate its growth into a fully fledged chick. First, the embryo develops a pointed, thickened layer of cells at the tail end. These cells form the basis for the head and backbone of the bird in making. Next comes the limbs, cardiovascular and respiratory systems, and the beak. Finally, the feathers and the claws are developed. An interesting behavioural pattern that has been noticed by those that observe the eggs of masked flatwings is the chick's ability to make noise from within the egg. The knowledge on why the chicks do this is limited, but there are some theories. A suggestion has been made that they could be attempting to communicate their needs to the parents. For example, they could be telling the parents that they need their egg to be rotated to ensure an even temperature. It could also be them signalling that they are ready to hatch. Or perhaps they're just spoilt little shits. When the chicks hatch, they are surprisingly well developed. They have a full coat of feathers and can feed themselves only a few hours after hatching. Their parents don't have to feed them regurgitated vomit for dinner. But enough about the kids. Time to meet mummy and daddy. One night in a busy nightclub, Daddy Lapwing was looking for a one night set, I mean, soulmate. After a few moments, he spotted her standing alone on the dance floor. Mummy Lapwing. She was perfect. So he abducted her like most other barbaric animal species and forced her to live happily ever after. Surprisingly, this isn't exactly true. In fact, pretty much all of it is untrue. Masked Lapwings will wait until the conditions are right before breeding. Usually this is between November and June, the warmer times in the land down under. Once they have determined that the conditions are suitable and they have discovered an area that is right for them, they will begin to build the nest. So today what we're going to do is we're going to replicate a masked lapwing nest. You know, I see why people call them plovers, it's much easier to say. Kind of annoying having to repeatedly say masked lapwing all the time. Let's look for an appropriate spot. Looks nice, but there's a tree here. Plus the grass is a bit too long. That looks like a good spot. It's flat, the grass is short, and there's no trees in sight. Well, there is trees in sight, but there's none that close. Perfect. So what we do, first of all, we get our digging boots on, and we just go... And there we have it. Yes, it's just a hole in the ground. But did you know that both of the parents contribute equally to the building of the nest? You know, it's kind of pathetic when your species is outdone on the gender equality front by a waiting bird. I mean, come on guys, we can do better than this. To add to this, both parents contribute equally to protecting and caring for the young, not only when they're still in the egg, but once they have hatched too. And they have a rather interesting way of protecting them. When they first notice you, they will remain relatively quiet, 
Depending on how far away you are, usually they will make a keck sounding noise once every few seconds as an acknowledgement of your presence and a warning signal to back off. It can also be used as an alert for other plovers in the area that a potential predator is here. If you have encountered masked flatwings in urban areas, chances are there wasn't really enough space for them to notice you without escalating to the next levels of alertness. As you get closer to them, they'll begin to keck louder and more frequently. They will also start flying around the area, landing in spots away from the nest. This is done as a means of diverting you away from the chicks. And if you ask me, it's pretty dang effective. When I was trying to feed them, I couldn't spot the chicks. Ever. You decide that you are not close enough. Perhaps you want to see more of the details. Or maybe you're just insane like me and you want to feed them live mealworms for some reason. Well, that doesn't matter because you start to crawl towards them anyway, wearing a jacket in the middle of summer because you'd rather be cooked like a roast chicken than to be hurt by a little bird. At this point, they will begin to swoop upon you. Initially, they may only make the gesturing movements of a swoop as a means of warning you to back off. Believe it or not, plovers don't actually want to attack anybody. That would require them to potentially risk their lives, which would practically spell the end for their chicks. Instead, they prefer to use their brain. Working in sync with each other, both parents will separate to different sides of the predator. One parent may swoop at you at first to distract you while the other one sneaks up from a different angle. They tried this shit on me too. Luckily, I knew what game they were playing. Eventually, they might even nick you with their spurs. Contrary to popular belief, they are not venomous. No, it'll just be painful instead. If you are super close to the nest, they will start to deploy different tactics. They may puff their chest up to appear larger and more threatening. They will also spread their wings out, even pretending to have a broken wing to distract predators. They really are quite selfless parents. In a way, I admire them more than most people. At least they don't destroy everything they touch. The parents usually only swoop potential predators until their chicks have reached an age of between two to three months old. This is what you are advised to do if there are nesting plovers in the area. First, you avoid the area. Well, no duh you avoid the area, but what if you can't avoid it? What if you live in a no through road and they are selflessly nesting in the only pathway that you can get out of? Well, you can travel in a group. Plovers have a tendency to swoop on individuals and avoid groups. But if you're like a huge contingent of Australians and you have no friends, you can always resort to other measures, such as wearing a hat, which can serve other purposes if you get what I mean. And you can carry a stick to swing at them when they swoop you. If you wanted to make long-term preparations, you can always plant shrubs or let the grass grow long, if council will let you do that. This will deter them from nesting in your backyard but most of the time, if you're around them a lot without being too threatening, they'll just keep to themselves. Maybe. Eventually. Just make sure not to panic, run, search for the nest, stare at them while they're swooping, or abduct their chicks and you'll be fine. Mostly. Once breeding season is over, they will significantly calm down. They will fly away from you if you get too close, as there's no point to attacking a predator. Instead, they'll keep their distance while feeding on mostly worms. While worms are their main dietary staple, it is not beneath them to eat other foods such as seeds, greens, fish, or even small crustaceans. During the winter, once breeding season is over, they will gather in groups of at least four, but a lot of the time it'll be more than that to stay in a small area such as near a water source. This is presumably to preserve energy. Once the weather heats up, they'll once again split up into pairs in order to breed, nest, and torment local populations. When you ask most people about masked lapwings, they will recount stories of many lost lunchtimes ruined by a bold plover who thought it was a good idea to nest in the middle of the oval. A smaller contingent may even portray them as actively seeking to be aggressive towards anyone and anything that moves. And while this is true to an extent, this doesn't tell you the full story. I firmly believe that no matter how menacing an animal may seem to you, there is always a softer side. Whether you should actively try to uncover it or not is something else entirely, but it is there, and masked lapwings are no exception.
While they possess bold nesting habits and even bolder means of defending said nest, they love each other and their offspring. Mike the Almighty Phoenix takes no responsibility for the consequences of following his actions or advice. Do proper and thorough research before attempting anything dangerous or stupid. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe. And before you go, I've created a new Discord server. If you want to pop by and say hello to me or participate in fun activities, please join the Land of the Phoenix today. The link is in the description.